My name is David Harris. On behalf of Professor Brown Nagin and Dean Manning, I want to welcome you to Harvard Law School for what is going to be a very special event today. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time. I will say that uh, this film and watching this film uh, was, for me, like a trip down memory lane. Uh, I think probably true for many of us here. I'm looking at median age. I think most of us feel in some way connected to it. Uh, the soundtrack for this was like the soundtrack for my high school and senior year. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I think it's really important. I was talking to Frank. I mean, I think uh, it's, I'm glad to see you all out here. The film really speaks to us not just in terms of nostalgia, but it also speaks to us about uh, what can happen, what young people can do uh, when they're determined and organized uh, to, change, uh, to, change, uh, to change our society. And uh, this year is the 50th anniversary, not only of uh, the strike at San Francisco State, but many other things. You know, as we know uh, uh, from Birmingham, from the uh, Memphis uh, Memphis strike, Memphis organizing, to the assassinations of Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy, to the current commission report, to the passage of the Fair Housing Act. A lot of things have happened. This is 50 years. We think about what's happened in those 50 years and what hasn't. And I think the things that haven't happened, we have to look to young people to help us work out. And so I uh, talked to Frank, I think we need to, we're going to have, have to have a second screening where we go back on campus and have a lot of young people present who need to see this film. So uh, before I introduce Frank and Abby, I want to kind of give some thanks to a bunch of co-sponsors we have. Uh, we have the Hutchins Center for African and American Research, the Prison Studies Project, the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education, Office of Student Affairs, Harvard Balsa, the Harvard Journal on Racial and Ethnic Justice, and the Transformative Justice Project. Uh, I want to kind of announce a couple of things that are coming up, a couple of events we have coming up soon. We'll have from March 2nd, we are co-sponsoring an event for the young people. We're going to screen Get Out. Uh, uh, that's going to be a different event. You know what I'm <laughs> So uh, you have to, we're trying to figure out the venue for that, so you'd have to check on our website uh, to find out what that. If you're not on our email list, I encourage you to go to the website and sign up. On March 21st, we'll host, Cass, host Catherine Lehman, the chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. On March 26th, we'll host Richard Rothstein, author of Color of Law. On March 29th, we'll show another film called Tribal Justice, which you probably know. Uh, with another Abby. With another Abby, this is the world of Abby's, uh, you know, Native American courts. And on April 2nd, we'll host Lynn Borden, the author of The Second Coming of the KKK. We have some other events in the hopper, and I do invite you uh, to uh, visit our site to find out more. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Abby Ginsberg and Frank Ross. And Abby was here, I can't believe, it was uh, six years ago, 2012. So it was a different thing. Uh, for a film, great film she did on Cruz and Oso. Uh, and uh, we're really glad to have her back. Abby is a, an award-winning uh, filmmaker and producer, and we're really pleased to have her. Frank uh, has, a, has an illustrious career in uh, uh, communications and uh, 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 working with several production and post-production companies and major networks. Uh, before I introduce them, as usual, I need to give all thanks and praise to my colleague Kelly Garvin, who helped make this happen. She had threatened to be here. She's not. Uh, but in her absence, I hope we'll all give her a round of applause because without her, we wouldn't have been. Yeah. I guess my man, I was going to do that and decided to stay away. So with that, I turn it over to Abby and Frank. So I want to give a shout out to all my friends from Boston and Cambridge who came. So thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for giving us a chance to share this film with you. It's, yeah, so this is the first time the film has been screened in the Boston area, so it's actually a big deal for us to be here as well. Um, when the film is over, we're going to have a Q&A, and following that, there's a reception. Because we didn't want people to schlump all the way here, and then, you know, we only are giving you water, we're not giving you drinks, but we are giving you some food, so please stay. Plan to stay for, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes before you leave. Um, and I really want to thank the Houston Center for inviting us and for making this happen. It is always a pleasure to be here at an event that they host. It's, I get their mailings, you know, three times a week. And rue the fact that I don't live in Boston. So I am so impressed by the amount of work that they do and the number of fabulous events that you get to come to if you live in Boston. So with that, I just want to say thanks so much for being here. We'll be back to talk to you afterwards. And here's Frank. 
And again, I'd also like to thank you all for coming out and for uh, Harvard hosting us and hosting this screen here, seeing some friends that I haven't seen for a very long time, uh, which is wonderful. Um, 50 years ago, Abby and I were students at Cornell University. Um, in September, we'll be there for a little bit of the start of my freshman year 50 years ago. And uh, Abby had already been there for a year. Um, we, Abby and I did not know one another at Cornell. We were introduced by a mutual friend at Santa Monica College, uh, where I've been the last 20 years, and decided to embark on this journey to, uh, to finish this film. We were introduced because the part of you that we both wanted to tell this story. Um, it says a lot that Abby and I didn't know, didn't, didn't know each other at that time. And uh, this film is a much better film because the two of us worked on this together. Um, we started off just to tell the Cornell story about our experiences at Cornell. I was one of the students inside the building that's depicted in the, in the uh, film. Abby was one of the students outside in, uh, in our support. And um, as I said, it's a, it's a better film because of that. Um, we started out to tell the Cornell story, but the raising money, as uh, I got to learn from documentary filmmaking, I came from the entertainment side where there was, already, there was always money to make the projects, right? So it took us seven years to complete this film. Seven years, Kickstarter campaign, friends contributing, but we got it done over the course of seven years. And a lot of it, our first major funding came from California Humanities that required us to do a film that had California content. And so this film depicts events at both Cornell and at San Francisco State, which turned out to be a perfect action for the Cornell story. So San Francisco State, 1968, Cornell, 1969. This film tells the story of what was happening on more than 1,000 college campuses across the country during that time. So I hope you will enjoy the ages of change. Thank you. Um, let me just say, the reason we're asking you to give us your email address is our film is going to be on TV in, on February 20th, and we are going to really, add, we'll send you an announcement, but it's going to be streaming. So for people who know young people, they can go find it as a streaming on the various streaming outlets, and we would really like you to help us get the word out. So um, it's on something called the World Channel, but when we send out the email, you'll get all the information. PBS. PBS. Local PBS yeah. affiliate. Ellen, do you know what the channel is here? WGBH. Oh, it's on Channel 2. The World Channel's on Channel 2. Depends on your cable. Oh, depends on your cable provider, right. but we'll help you. 44 here in the Boston area. That would be great. So um, we, should t we should give a, I mean, Frank gave you a little bit of our background beforehand. Um, what you want to know is that it took us seven years to make this film. You know, it's a labor of love for us. Nobody paid us to do it. We just cobbled together enough money to put on the screen what you saw. And you can imagine the music rights were pretty Steep. expensive. <laughs> um, and, you know, let me say that people, with one exception, people were really willing to come together and be interviewed. People wanted to sort of go back and remember. And I, I would just say, sort of watching the film again here, that these events were so defining in people's lives that it was as if they were back there again, even though our interviews were done, you know, some 40 years after the events had happened. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give a few acknowledgments. Yes. Um, Marta Wall was our editor on this film who did a tremendous job and if you know anything about filmmaking and editing. Also, in addition to the 12 classic songs that we had to pay through the nose for, <laughs> all the, the original music score, yeah, the original music score was composed by Patrice Russian who came aboard and just did a phenomenal job for us on that as well. And, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, there are a few folks from uh, Cornell back in the era to, in the room that I would certainly like to acknowledge. Uh, Ron Ferguson, who is here with you at, at Harvard, has been here for many years, Dr. Ron Ferguson. <laughs> Irene Smalls, who's in the film, is in the back there, who came with us. And Susan Reverby, who's another Cornellian who's from that time. And Anne-Marie Wilkins, right here in the front, who's a Cornell student in my class. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, seven years to make the film. Ron was actually in the building as well, and he made, I guess you saw the shot of yourself coming out of the building as well. 
uh, Saran, myself, were inside the building. Abby was one of the SDS students outside the building, supporting the students inside the building. And certainly we did not know, uh, none of us knew that we'd still be talking about this uh, 50 years later, that's for sure. Um, but uh, again, as we continue to take this film around the country, usually, and that's why it's always great doing the Q&A, people in the audience have their own stories about what was happening on their college campuses at that time, because again, this was happening on more than 1,000 college campuses across the country. It's been great for us also to, uh, to get the film out to younger audiences, uh, young people today who have no idea that this ever happened. And it's interesting that you know so many students gave up so much that it, uh, there would be uh, black and ethnic studies programs, and yet uh, people don't seem to know about that. And so I think that's important that, um, as, uh, as David Harris said, that we get this film to younger people here at Harvard as well. So let's open it up. Yeah, go ahead. A factual question. If I went to jail for a year, Jerry Bernardo. Okay. What, what, what happened to him? He, well, yeah, I mean, you know the fear of the, the police and the, the judicial system. And, but what was he, where it was, you know, touching a dean's elbow and various. I don't he know. he I became an attorney. What was he charged with? He I, became I an attorney. Know, I don't know what he was charged. With. I can't remember. It, yeah, we. But he served a year. A year. But yeah. You don't know for what. I can't remember for what. I mean, there were all kinds of violations that people actually committed, and that's sort of the difference. I mean, one of the things that we thought was striking is that Cornell is known for that iconic image and sort of for the threat of violence. But where the real violence took place was in San Francisco State. And so, you know, heads were busted, people were injured, a lot of people, 500 people went to jail. Um, why he didn't get out is because he was a leader. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what else they stuck on him. And Jimmy Garrett, who was told he had to leave town for five years. I mean, I, I don't know why they didn't manage to beat those charges, but they didn't. And so a lot of people suffered a lot in San Francisco. I, no, I think it was more than that. Um, and I think, I don't think we actually asked him. Yeah, yeah. And, but, but an important message in the film is what so many people were able to achieve in anyway. spite of what happened during that time, you know, which is very, very important. Ramona Tasco is like a phenomenal story in the, in the, because she ended up having to sit down with S.I. Hayakawa and negotiate on behalf of black studies and the ethnic studies department. Because so many of the black men were already in jail. In jail. Exactly. That's sort of the point. Exactly. She actually changed her major. She was uh, studying law at the time, and instead she became a physician. And she ended up going head-to-head -head with S.I. Hayakawa in the negotiations at the end. And later in life, she became S.I. Hayakawa's personal physician for a time. <laughs> But she's a first responder now, as far as uh, medical uh, profession is concerned. She um, was uh, leading part of the team in Haiti after the earthquake in Haiti, the bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Kenya. She also was, uh, was there. So she's a phenomenal story herself. Zachary Carter, who's in the film, you know, he was appointed by President Clinton as the youngest U.S. attorney and for the Houston District of New York. He's currently the corporate counsel for the city of New York. Danny Glover, you all know, who's an actor and is as an activist. So one of the things we say as far as students are concerned is that your a, a participation, you know, if you played sports, coaches would always tell you the way you practice is the way you play. And, you know, it's important for students to know that it's important for them at this time because college is still pretty much a protected environment. It's important that you really understand the re, uh, responsibility you have as a student to have your voice um, heard and to stand up for what you believe. And this is a good time as a student to actually do that. And it carries forward for the rest of your life. And it doesn't necessarily limit you in terms of what you'll be able to accomplish in your life. So I'm curious to know if um, any of, of these former students and uh, former leaders, if they talked about having some type of a conference to um, look at you know, what happened, impart that knowledge to the next couple of generations and see you know, how uh, things could be um, put in a way that um, 
you know, more students could maybe not make the same mistakes, you know, that were made in the past. I mean, there hasn't been a specific conference per se in which all the people in the film have come together, but there have been many mini conferences and many screenings of the film where people participating in the film are sitting up here with us. Um, and, I, you know, I think people focus more on the importance of the activism and the importance of their commitment than on the importance of the mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think in the process of crafting this film, that's where we were headed. I mean, of course, mistakes were made both at San Francisco State and at Cornell. But we were telling a different story. Mm. Um, and, and I think, it's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with getting together and figuring out the mistakes, but the question about what's relevant from this film to students today is more about being less reserved and less worried about your future and more about standing up for what's right, right here and now. Or there won't be a future. Or there won't be a future. <laughs> and so this film is in many ways a tribute to our activism and to the activism of the people in the film. And the fact that some people paid sort of bigger prices at San Francisco State is in there, but that sort of wasn't the point. And both Jimmy Garrett and Jerry Venardo would say that they went on to have quite successful careers as attorneys and are really glad that they fought as hard as they did at San Francisco State. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say mistakes weren't made, but there's a reason that we don't focus on it, and there's a reason that I think it hasn't been the subject of much of the follow-up from this film. All right. we, do, we do tell students uh, on college campuses, do not pick up a gun. Yeah, we do do that. <laughs> Tactics were different at that time. And, and, uh, and that wasn't the point. It wasn't Cornell the point, either. exactly. You know. It just kind of happened, and we were very fortunate at that time. Thank you for the film. Thank you for the film. Um, I haven't been following things that carefully, but the students at UMass uh, Boston, uh, not too far from here, have a real problem because of cuts and uh, things, it's very different from what's happening here. And I was wondering if you had any intention to show it to students like that where there are real problems and real cutbacks right now. You know, we are available. I mean, and the film is available. And for all we know, because we're not our own educational distributor, UMass, M UMass Boston has the film. But Part of your job is to tell people where you, who you know that this film might be helpful to the campus oh, okay. because we yeah, follow up. Know you know what I mean? It's like you know those people. We're both from California. I'm from Berkeley. Oh, oh, Frank's okay. from L.A. Okay. So, you know, if you have a way of letting people know about this film, that would be fabulous. Okay. That's great. Thank but you. But we're both originally New Yorkers. <laughs> <laughs> In the back, there's a hand. <laughs> So thanks a lot for a really great film. Um, I was a member of NYUSDS, and um, a couple of observations or comments. Um, the first is, um, when I, I only saw the, the picture, and my impression of what happened there was informed, and it just shows the, you know, the insidiousness of corporate media, the lack of understanding. I had no idea that there had been a cross burning, and I was a member of SDS. No idea the context in which that image uh, occurred. So, you know, to me that's quite striking and quite interesting and quite important how you put it into a, so that people can understand even though I'm sadly, you know, 50 years later we're getting to understand better some of what happened. Um, the second thing is um, when years after uh, our experience at NYU, some of us learned from um, uh, uncovering uh, documents, FBI documents, that there had under COINTELPRO and similar programs that anonymous letters had been sent to the black students at NYU or the SDS, SDS people, pitting and trying to pit people against each other, that one of many kinds of things that were done. And as I always watch a film like this, I, I find myself wondering, hmm, I wonder where and how that kind of thing might have been deployed in some of these situations not to deflect from the essence of the struggle that was, that, that was shown. Um, but I wondered if you uncovered anything or from your own direct experience or subsequent knowledge, what you might have to say about that. And finally, I always, I've always felt that no one really, largely, who speaks about this period ever appreciates 
the overwhelming importance of police violence in all that happened through these years. So thank you. Well, um, informers. <laughs> there, there were definitely. Let me say this: there were definitely informers in the anti-war movement, SDS stuff in upstate New York, including Cornell. Yes. So people were being provoked to do more, quote, take, try to take more violent action, et cetera. I don't think, but I mean, SDS and the black students had a kind of mutually respectful relationship. And I don't think that we were being seen, I don't think dissent was being sown between those groups. They were too busy trying to set up, at least at Cornell, the anti-war the people who had either burned their draft cards were thinking of burning their draft cards. That was how they were going to kind of siphon off a certain group of activists. As and they had really targeted, in our experience, it had been the anti-war movement. Yeah, but there were, there were certainly in, informants. Um, we got um, the probably the last meaningful interview with uh, Dr. Dale Corson at Cornell. Uh, he was 96 years old when we interviewed him. Lucid. I mean, he remembered dates, everything. And we'd ask, there were some questions that, that Abby, she did that interview, and she'd ask uh, Dr. Corson, and he'd say, I'm not going to talk about that. You know, but we knew, but he did indicate that there were students who talked to him. He was in the know. He knew things that were going on because students talked to him. Um, so there, there certainly were informants. And, you know, we have ideas of who they might have been, but, you know, whatever. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Um, and just to say one other thing, I mean, th there is the comment that James Turner makes in the film about unlike many universities, the administrators tended to be the progressives. Mm -hmm. That was somewhat unique at Cornell. And just to give sort of, you know, James Perkins his due, he came from the Carnegie Foundation or institution or whatever it was called and was appalled when he got to Cornell in 63 and saw that there were 23 black students. So part of the effort to expand the number of black students came from his kind of white liberal sense that the campus was way too segregated and he was part of the effort to expand, you know, the whatever, the recruitment of black students to the campus. And that was the beginning and end of what they did. So as a result, you actually got an increased number of black students with no support, no backing, no nothing. Um, but Perkins was a liberal to the end. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, he, it mattered to him. And when he was trying to negotiate this and Dale Corson was on the front lines, these two guys, when they said, you know, I just wanted to make sure those students got out of the building, you know, without anybody getting hurt. At San Francisco State, they didn't give a damn. Mm -hmm. You know, in a way, the more injuries, the better. So you really had different people running the show at both institutions. Right. How, how long after did he get fired? Immediately. Yeah, right he away. was fired in June. They, they exited the building in, in April, and he was fired by June. First meeting of the Board of Trustees, he was out. Mm -hmm. it, I, I think it's important to note, um, again, Perkins came to Cornell in 1963. And it was at that point, I believe, there were only seven black students Oh. At, and he was appalled. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. Um, so I arrived in the fall of 1963 um, at Cornell, and there were, in fact, no black students. <laughs> hmm. There were no black students, and there were no black students um, except Africans, of course, the only, and there were almost no African Americans. And um, Gloria Joseph, who you showed here, who was a grad student, mm -hmm. um, who, for those of you who track feminist history, was Audre Lorde's um, lover at the end of Audre's life. Um, and uh, G Gloria was my house mother, and she scared me to death. <laughs> I was this little upstate New York kid, and I was scared to death of her. Um, but it was a very, uh, I think one thing to remember about Cornell and like Harvard is because it's partly a land grant college, is that you're talking of an institution that had lots of upstate New York. Um, farmer farm, types, farm, farmer types, farm kids. The ag school and I yep. was then called the home ag school. So and I was in industrial and labor relations. So I think it's uh, all of which were state schools. It was a very interesting and very divided institution with lots of you know New York Jews, you know, um, from downstate, and then lots of uh, people who had never seen a black person or seen a Jewish person before right. in their life until they got to Cornell. So I think that sets. You know some of that, and the only other point I'd make about this is there was also a real divide in the faculty as well. So we used in the anti-war movement, we used to say that, that the votes would bring the troglodytes out, which is how we thought of some of the faculty um, out of whatever cave they were hiding in to show up for these meetings to vote against anything progressive. 
Right. I, I would say that, you know, the, um, the black students who were on campus when my class arrived, and I was a freshman in 1968, our class doubled the number of African-American students that were at Cornell at that time. And the, uh, the upper class students, Irene, had been there a year or two before, and she was one of the students that endured a lot more than, than we did. Um, but the students uh, who had been there before, the African-American students, they were, they were ready. All they needed was a critical mass of students uh, to support. And in 1968 was the first year that Cornell really aggressively went to the inner cities around the country to, uh, to recruit. And so they brought in kind of a, a larger group, a different group of black students. Who kind of, I, mean, I grew up on the, in the public housing projects on the Lower East Side of New York City. And uh, a lot of my classmates uh, was, have a similar story. Uh, Ron was from Cleveland, and uh, we were from, like, uh, like I said, inner, inner city kids. So we were not necessarily really political when we got there. You know, we kind of like learned on the fly. Um, but we were kind of like the infantry. And I think it's, it's important to also know that in these kinds of situations, you don't have to necessarily be a leader. You don't have to necessarily be a leader. I wasn't a leader, but um, we all made a commitment to something, as Jackie says, in the, as Zach says in the film, to do something that was, that was bigger than us and more important to, uh, than us as, as far as individuals were concerned. And so we all bonded together in order to achieve something that we knew was important to get done. And I know Irene wait, would like wait, to say a, a word. There's a young woman here, though. Hang on a sec, Irene. Oh, okay. uh, all right, yeah. Hi, thank you so much. This was a really heartening film to watch, especially having done some organizing both with and against administration here in the past two years. Um, so. I was really interested in seeing these different stories as kind of microcosms of a larger movement. Um, like we see Reagan as a governor who then went on to be a president and still had these views. Yeah. Um, and so thinking about this in 2018, when we have you know Donald Trump in office, we have FBI reports of black identity um, extremists, right? Um, my question is kind of how do you think that the new rhetoric that we're getting at a national level is um, you know, kind of related to the things that we saw in the film? And then also, I'd love to hear your takes on nationalizing and internationalizing some of these movements, working with South Africa and the Rose Must Fall movement as an example, where people are fighting the same issues. Well, let me just say, I took this film to South Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I took it to you know, a group of, I went to the University of Cape Town Law School. Um, with this film, and they totally related to it. I mean, they were just glad to know something about American history. We were in the middle of the Fees Must Fall campaign there. Um, and we had a very robust discussion. So, I mean, I sort of feel like this would be a good film to go back. Frank wasn't with me. I was there for some other reason. I had done a film on South Africa. Um, so I think you're right that there's a lot of kind of cross-currents within the, what, what the students there are facing, what students here are facing, um, and as I say, we had, it was a really good discussion and they were really glad that, you know, their dean had brought the school, the film there. Um, about today and sort of how this film relates, Frank, let me think about what I want to say about that. You have something to think. No, I was just going to add to that. I've, I've taken students on study abroad programs five times through um, University of Cape Town. And it's really interesting. We talk about the need to understand history. Um, it was, we were really taken by the fact that the African students there did not know much about apartheid. Yeah. And it, it was, was and, and, was and, really and you know, we began talking to them about it. They were just like, oh, really? Our, our parents don't talk about this. Our, tar our parents just do not talk about this. Talk to some parents, and the idea was they didn't want their children to understand how what bad how bad it had been because they felt that they would be so angry that it would be impossible for them to move forward themselves because they'd be so upset with that. So they didn't share the history with their own with their own children. So when we talk about a film like this and the importance of these stories, just you know, for not just for students here in America, but all across the world, to understand the histories and the struggles of people of color all over the world. And after you say something, I know Irene would like to. So I, I, I mean, and I guess what I would say about you know the current kind of dialogue that we're having, um, you know, again, I've been an activist since I was seventeen, and maybe mm -hmm. even before. Of, co I, of course, I, have, I feel like I've never seen anything as bad as what we're in at this moment. Yes. But I also feel the power of the resistance. And so for me, because I'm an optimist and I can't get up in the morning if I don't have some reason to be optimistic, for me, it's the power of the resistance that's going to keep me going and us going. 
And so I tend to focus more on that than how incredibly depressing some of the national dialogue is and how racist some of it is and so on. And I would say, you know, that we have to just really own the resistance and, and really feel like we're part of something again. And so in a funny way for me personally, this is a good time. Things were really bleak in the late 60s. I mean, and we were fighting, a, you know, a war in which, as you looked around, you thought maybe some of your classmates were going to have to go fight, etc. So it's like, I don't know. I mean, I feel what keeps me going and what keeps me kind of engaged in pushing back against where we are is having a film like this. I also have a film on the Japanese incarceration where they started talking about the incarceration of Japanese Americans as a precedent for locking up Muslims and for everything else we're doing to Muslims today. So I have a second film that permits me to kind of engage in that dialogue. And so for me, all I can say is I'm part of the resistance and that's the only way I know you know, how to keep breathing, working, moving on, and being in rooms like this so that, you know, we can sort of say, look, this is a resource that exists. If any of you have connections to other communities, please, whether it is a public library, whether it is a high school, because there were some people here from Concord Academy, whatever it is, think about how you can help this film be kind of an antidote to the stuff that you're referring to that's going on in the national media and in our national consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I would say we need you to help us do more with this film and with films like this so we can kind of change the dialogue to make it more humane and more of what we need done in this country. So, And Abby's other film is called And Then They Came For Us, about the Japanese internment. Very important film to see as well. Um, thank you. For me to grow up in Harlem, New York, and be told that black women were promiscuous and black women couldn't do this and all this other kind of stuff, I was like, no, that's not my life. And because of the fact that we were smart to begin with, we were the best of the best. And we had been solidly, shall we say, grounded in the black experience in re under segregation. <laughs> you know, one of the things that segregation did was that black people socialized each other. And we told each other that we were okay. So when I went to a school that said I was not okay, I wasn't going to take that. Mm -hmm. And there were other students like Frank, you know, and like Ron who said, you're right, we're okay. We've been okay all our lives. What makes us bad? What makes us inferior? What makes us small? And the other aspect is that it was an SDS member, uh, Ron, not Ron, but uh, Dave. Burek. Who Burek. put, Dave Burek, who put... Uh, Frank and Abby together. So the reason this film happened at all was because of what Dave did in terms of he knew Frank and he knew Abby and they were trying to make a film and he said, well, you two need to talk and this is what we have today. So there were a lot of connections and I guess the concept that if you come from a solid African-American experience, which is getting harder and harder to find these days because <laughs> there's so many different types of media coming at us. And someone mentioned about uh, black activists get, getting together. I've just been invited back to Cornell for the 50th anniversary of Warry House. I mean, I was the founder of Warry House as a wild 18-year-old who wouldn't take stuff from anybody and you know, had to negotiate with the, uh, the administration around a black woman's residence and why there was a need for a black women's residence. And again, because you could not tell me that I was not okay. 18 years I've been told I was okay. I can't come to a school that says to me, oh, you were depressed and you were you know, underprivileged and so on and so forth. So a lot of what that film represents is those inner city kids, those brilliant inner city kids from the lower class, the lower middle class, who had the talent and the drive and the belief to make things happen. Thank so you. I thank you, Abby, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm.
Go ahead. Curric curriculum has being is being developed. It's pilot. It's being piloted this semester actually at Cornell. I'm going from here to meet with her in Ithaca uh, to further refine it and make sure it's also applicable and available for high school students. So yes, that is happening, and there will be a curriculum to uh, accompany the uh, the film itself. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, we hi. love you, young people. <laughs> <laughs> My question is about um, allyship when there's an erosion of trust. So in the recent elections, people are like, what's wrong with white women? Because like, <laughs> the, you know, the voting returns for the president and then in Alabama. And so I'm wondering, like, when you were on campus, how did you guys form great ally? You know, how did you guys? Well, we did. There was, let me just say that it was sort of separate. You know what I mean? It's like I was part of SDS. But the, you know, which had more of an anti war focus. But every time there was an action taken by the black students or something against, you know, recruitment on campus, there were all different issues that kept coming up. We saw ourselves as allies of every sort of progressive stance that anybody was taking. So this thing about, you know, the black students took over this building, I still remember getting woken up, you know, at whatever time it was. 5.30, 6 o'clock, saying you have to come down to the straight. And I'm like, why? You just do what I tell you and get here. And, you know, it's freezing cold and there's icy rain. And I did I, what did I do? I put on my coat and I went down there because I knew I was being called for a reason and I would find out what that reason was once I got there. So there was good allyship, but there wasn't, it wasn't like we were having a kind of merged experience. We were having a sort of separate experience, but... You know, you see the white people, and our job was to defend the building, defend the black students in the building against, we didn't do a very good job of it, obviously, since people broke in, but the notion of what we thought we were doing, you know, was forming this kind of little circumference around the building so nobody would break through, and of course, the minute the football team wanted to, we all pulled, you know, they had to kind of just push us aside, and then they tried to break in. Yeah. Um, but it was a, I don't know how else to say it, except that there are going to be good white allies in every situation, and you have to be looking for them. And I would say the same thing about, you know, sort of when we go to campuses and talk about students say, we have X problem, who do we talk to? Part of what I say is, and Frank would say I think the same thing, is go look for progressive faculty members. On every, they may be white, they may be Asian, they may be black, they may be Latina, who knows? But you can figure out who the progressives are and if you've got a big issue, you got to ally with them as well, because they will have some ideas about maybe where the pressure points are in the struggle, you know, and what they can help you bring to the table. So I think in every struggle, we're looking for the right allies, mm -hmm. and you don't want to write off all white women because, well, yeah. you know, <laughs> no, I, just, I mean, <laughs> like a bunch of them voted yeah. the wrong way, and <laughs> we're now all paying for it. Way too many. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, I guess I would just say that allies exist in every community and on every campus. And, you know, the job is to find them and to pull them into whatever coalition you're working on mm -hmm. so that you don't feel so isolated yourself. Can I just give one example that came out of the University of Chicago? When I showed the film at the University of Chicago, the students said, we are having, the black students, it was a largely black student event. The black students at the University of Chicago last year were having a problem because the cafeteria closed at noon on Saturday and didn't reopen till Monday morning. And that meant there, there was serious food insecurity on the part of anybody who was on a scholarship because they were eating on the meal plan. They didn't have money to go eat out for the, you know, the six meals that they were missing. And the question was what to do about that. So we had kind of a strategy session about where they might find allies to raise the visibility of that issue so it didn't become some little hidden thing that, you know, 40 black students were dealing with, but it became a campus crisis that had to be fixed. And that's sort of what happened. But all I'm saying is that 
you know, in that room, there were people saying, well, why don't you talk to so-and-so, and why don't you talk to the, you know. And that wouldn't have happened if someone hadn't brought the subject up. Mm-hmm. So you never know where there's going to be good advice. Yeah, and I, 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 I've been, um, I felt good about the fact that as far as a lot of the demonstrations happening today with young people are multicultural. I mean, they really are. Um, but one thing that still needs to be addressed in terms is, is the question of who's leading. And, you know, back in the 1960s and up into the mid-1970s, it was critical for black students that we do form coalitions, but we're calling the shots. Right. It's like you can't have other people driving your agenda. That just was not the situation. Um, so we still have um, a way to go before we get to the point when we, find, when we form these multicultural uh, collaborations in terms of having an agenda as equals in terms of who's setting the agenda, in terms of what's happening. And I still think we have a way to go before we get to that. I just want to thank you for, it was a wonderful thing. It really is. Um, and just in response to the point that the young student here was raising, I think there was a lot to learn from that scene where, in Cornell, where you had a campus that was largely oblivious and then there's an armed takeover, and everybody had to pay attention. And then there were teachings everywhere where people were discussing, well, why is this happening? Yeah. <laughs> and people who were oblivious one week had to confront questions the next, and then they changed. And I think it's an important kind of, and now, you know, it's important to understand because you can look at something like this and just feel nostalgic because I think a lot of us who are older in this room. Our lives all changed in that period of time. You know, right. I, I went to a high school that was, you know, in the vicinity of San Francisco State, and we watched what was going on. And then, you know, within six months, my high school was on strike for ethnic studies, mm-hmm. and it was, you know, it was very similar kind of things where, you know, nobody considered themselves a leader. But I went with a friend to where they were taking over the cafeteria just thinking I was going to express an opinion and found myself suspended that evening. Yeah, right. And, you know, and then, you know, then we had to kind of figure out what we thought, what our convictions were, and follow them through. And I think one of the things about this film that you get a sense of is that it took sacrifice. Mm-hmm. It, you know, I, I think it's really relevant to what the moment that's happening now. Yep. Because in March, you know, the, you know, the DACA decisions end, you know, the president made very clear what his position was in the speech the other night, and people are going to have to make some decisions, Yes. because they're either going to go along with this, and all of this will have been for naught, and others, you know, we got black studies at our high school, I lived in California most of my life, and we watched it be whittled away every year after, you know, we lived through kind of taking away affirmative action in California. These were sea change things when you didn't stand up to defend yeah. those things. Yes. They rolled they right over you, exactly. Gone. And I don't think you can look at the present situation and recognize that if people aren't willing to, to really take some daring action in the face of what's actually coming down here, yeah, well, the uh, then a film like this is for naught. Yes. But well, I think if you know, I think if people actually kind of absorb the lessons of it, and they're willing to do what's actually required to make sure they're not going to drag away, reopen the concentration camps for the Japanese and whom. I mean, that's the moment we're living in now. Yeah, but it, I mean, the question today is, what is it going to take? What is it going to take? As you, as you, you know, back at Cornell, yeah, there were several demonstrations before Willard Strait Hall. There were several demonstrations, and you know, other students just went about their business, no big thing, right? It took guns being introduced for finally people to pay attention and say, what the hell is this all about? What is happening? And I asked the question today, what is it gonna take? I mean, well, look at what's happened in, in just the past, in the past year. Look at all the things that have happened, and how much more is it gonna take before we take to the streets? I mean, you know, before something happens. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about what that might be. Is DACA going to be it? We already see pushback in terms of, you know, that that might, that might not be enough. So it's a real question in terms of, uh, you know, what we call this American democracy. What is it going to take? Because the majority of the people in this country um, don't believe in what's happening right now. The majority of the people do not believe in what's happening right now, yet 
it's continuing to get, as my mother would say, wassa and wassa. Wassa and wassa. Yeah. So I wanted to maybe follow up a little bit about what James asked about the media, how they portrayed this event. But I want to talk maybe a little bit about a certain kind of intelligentsia. I remember when Alan Bloom came out with his book, which was one of the biggest selling books in the United States in the late 1980s, The Closing of the American Mind. Over and over you'd always hear, well, Bloom started his crusade against relativism because of what happened at Cornell. And it was always, the vision was that Bloom wrote in that book how wonderful the universities were in the 1950s. Exactly. And we needed to go back to that time. And I think this is a really common theme in a certain kind of folklore of conservatism that unprovoked, these angry African Americans took guns, there was no reason, they were just part of a relativist culture that they were going to destroy Western civilization. And this is a theme you find a lot among neocons and the right. Many people ensconced in academe as much as we hear how left-wing academe is. But, you know, there's a bunch of people like this. And I wanted to hear a little bit of your reflections about how some of the intellectuals, not just the media, have written about, well, about All Cornell. right, so Alan Bloom was my professor at Cornell. <laughs> I mean, and he was really one of the odd, I mean, he was almost like, you know, he wa what he wanted to go back to was sort of a platonic society where there were only, you know, guys in togas. Um, and he was a, an incredibly, before, this was long before he wrote his best-selling book, but Alan Bloom was one of maybe five professors that totally took the position this guy has just sort of identified, left Cornell before, you know, somewhere between that summer and the next fall, and went to the University of Chicago, and several other professors sort of followed suit who just simply said, I'm here to be in an ivory tower. My ivory tower has been, you know, turned upside down by these black students. I can't function here. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. We actually interviewed another historian whose name was Richard Polenberg, who said that he was of that mindset until various other things happened. And he came around to realize that he was wrong. But this was happening at a moment in time where, I mean, my father was an academic, and it was hard for him to imagine students having any control at Columbia. And it was just hard for all these guys who had basically been at these universities that in many cases were run by the faculty as fiefdoms. Mm -hmm. Students were literally there, at, you know, because you had to spend two hours a week teaching them. Otherwise, all you wanted to do was write your books or do whatever else. And this was being upended all around the country. That's part of what it means when we say there were a thousand, you know, struggles going on at a thousand different universities. So the place was no longer going to be an ivory tower. That was part of what the results of all these protests were. And people like Alan Bloom, he left Cornell, he got to Chicago, he created his own little kind of mini society there, and I think he felt like he did the best he could for sort of recreating the ivory tower he was looking for. Several other professors went to UC Berkeley, which seemed insane to me, because Berkeley had already established itself as a place where you were gonna hear from students at least three times a week. But there was an exodus from Cornell that was directly related to this. And my reaction was, you know, good riddance. I mean, that was my personal reaction. You know, if you hate the fact that student voices need to be heard in one way or another in this university, then goodbye. Mm -hmm. So I, that doesn't totally answer it, but. Yeah, but, but to your point also, when we, when we screened the film at Cornell for, for Homecoming, uh, which we were, we were really concerned about, and it, <laughs> Then the screening room happened to be in Willard Strait Hall. There was a lot, there was almost PTSD in the room. <laughs> it was, we were, we were very, we were very concerned about that one. Uh, but it worked out, uh, you know, it worked out okay. Um, one of the things I want to say about Polenberg, um, it was actually his daughter. And it took him about 10 years before his daughter said something to him about it. And he really had to start thinking about it once again after all of this time had passed. And um, unfortunately, we were not able to use his interview in the film. But I remember him saying, you know, quite candidly, you know. I was wrong. I was wrong. Um, and the university is probably a better place because of what happened then. 
you know, so, but it, it took him 10 years to get there and it took him, took him his daughter questioning why he still held that same position. And can I just want to say one other thing. This, one of the things that you see in the film, when James Perkins is talking to that large crowd of 10,000 students, most of those students at that point are white because where, where were the African-American students who had left the building? They had left the campus. I mean, they had kind of done their bit and we were... We went to the Penn Relays. Yeah, okay. We, we needed they, some R&R. &R. We, were 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 we were just, we were just, it was so of, stressful, we, we had to get out of town. So literally, <laughs> the white progressives were organizing the other white students on that campus to kind of bring everybody along. And part of the challenge was to actually engage with the professors who were sort of on the fence because that vote, when the faculty voted not to go for the amnesty, the campus, I mean, that campus could have tro totally blown up. And what kept that campus from completely blowing up was the fact that there was a lot of dialogue over two days between students and their professors. And so when the next vote happened, enough people had changed their minds that it, it was clear the students weren't going to give up their position, and it was clear that the faculty was going to have to rethink under very kind of extreme circumstances, you know, their connection to this ivory tower. And when the second vote happened, as I say, there had been a lot of dialogue. I mean, we were leafleting and we were trying to engage. We were calling professors at home. You know, we had, you could find their home numbers in the phone book. In those days, there were phone books. Um, and so there was a lot of work that was done to try to bring the faculty to a different place than where it started. Hmm. And I think that ultimately you know, meant that some people who could not be brought along had to leave, and everybody else was sort of part of the new era. And slowly but surely, and it took time for a lot of them, kind of changed their views of how they saw the students mm -hmm. and what opportunities they thought the students might deserve to have in kind of the governance of the place. So that was another piece of what was going on there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, say that I also was unaware about the cross burning at Cornell. Mm -hmm. um, and I was at Washington University in St. Louis, which like Cornell had recruited people from New York, Chicago, LA, and we all were sitting in as well. Um, and Two summers later, I was in Mississippi working with Charles Evers and doing voter registration. And a third year law student from Harvard, Johnny Lance Laylor, who had a southern accent and was from Texas, and I saw that the Klan was recruiting, trying to build up in Mississippi. And stupidly, we went to the meeting. I mean, he told me, don't open your mouth. You know, put on a dress, do not open your mouth. But I bring this up because at the meeting, they showed a movie called Revolution Today that had pictures of the Cornell sit-in and had pictures of our sit-in in Washington University where I was on the screen. Oh my mm. God. And I was like sh shrinking. Um, <laughs> but their storyline was, and this was 1968, 69, but their story was that this was a communist conspiracy. Take over. That the Russians brought blacks to Russia to train them. The Jews were bankrolling this. And of course, who was sending the money down to pay for us down to work in Mississippi? It was the Jews who raised money for the NAACP in New York. But I, I'm glad you brought this, your story forward as agents of change, but there were, there's that other counter narrative um, and I'm sure others, you know, as to not just what the Klan was thinking, but, and, and the, it, the meeting was pretty f amazing because it was like a church picnic. So it was sort of, 
you know, families from Mississippi who mm. were being indoctrinated with this story. Well, that's just that's just an amazing add-on to this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, wow, who would have thought? <laughs> Having never been to a Klan meeting, I <laughs> didn't really think about that. Um, okay, or, or, we, yes. just one more here. Oh, oh sorry. I, I know it's not a campus thing, but the Yuhuru movement, the reparations of white people to black people, is actually a way that people can contribute. Any, any people, but especially white people, can contribute reparations right now uh, to the black power movement, where they're funding candidates that have been, are in um, uh, Florida that have actually been arrested now, and they're um, building a house also in uh, St. Louis. So that um, this, although it's not a campus thing, it is a way of solidarity with um, of white people with black people that is um, where the leadership is definitely black. And um, so... I, Thank you. I, Thank and you. I don't think in the other mo the other groups that I've been with that you ever go in and tell another group how to only the liberals do that. <laughs> 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 but, um, <laughs> but I wanted to mention that you can give reparations right now. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, again, I want Thank to you all. Everybody.